morning, everyone. Um, just before I leave the introduction, just to talk about a friend of mine who's really informed uh, this time on the credit is our father. So it gives me great pleasure this morning to welcome Max Moke uh, to our topic of human medicine series. Uh, Max is a internationally recognized uh, geneticist, uh, neurogeneticist, and overall geneticist um, that is uh, visiting us from Vienna all the way to the And uh, his, uh, his background is that he uh, underwent his medical school training at the Free University of Berlin uh, and based on a uh, scholarship in further training at Yale. At Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, where he went on that. Uh, and then I think it was in 2000, you went to the NIH, um, joined the Human Research Institute. And since 2000, uh, since uh, 2007, was it, that you've been head of the medical right? Since 2000. Oh, since 2000. Um, uh, Max is one of those few people that has a syndrome name to him. Uh, in fact, the most common craniosynostosis syndrome, not known as the most syndrome. Uh, which is most people know. Um, and uh, he has a, uh, he, his work was instrumental in, um, in making the connection Sonic Hedgehog and Craniofacial Um His current uh, interests include the multifactorial uh, idiopathogenesis of whole uh, brain malformation, particular holoprosencephaly. And uh, on that note, um, I'd like to welcome Max for being here. And uh, we look forward to Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and among friends, colleagues, training. So really happy to be here. So I'll tell you about holoprosencephaly and I'll tell you everything I know in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the outline. I'll tell you what is holoprosencephaly, even though it seems like the same bring calls to new classes. I'll tell you a little bit about the embryology I tell you about genetic and environmental causes, and then if there is time, I'll talk about new directions. And at the end, I'll give you a summary. Even though I have nothing to disclose, I, I like to tell you where my where, where my salary comes from. I'm a federal employee. I work at the Department of Health and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I, I give lots of talks around the globe. I enjoy traveling a lot. In the past, I would always show photos of my boss, and ever since I showed the photo of the Current boss, most recently, there was a booing in the room. So I took that. I, I took. I, I took. I took. I took the slide out. So I, I don't do that anymore. So other than being a federal employee, some of my salary comes from Wiley, and I am the editor in chief of American <laughs> Journal of Medical Genetics on your left, and the founding editor in chief of Molecular Genetics and Genomic Medicine. My colleague Suzanne Hart took over as editor in chief the journal on the right this year since the. Uh, American Journal of Medical Genetics is quite some work. It's, we, we receive 1,200 manuscripts a year, so every morning when I open my email, there are five more manuscripts, and wow. I, have to, I have to do something with it. So it, it keeps me busy, which I like. Okay. So this is what the lab is working on. We work on holoprosencephaly, craniosynostosis syndromes, on congenital cardiac anomalies, and we work on those because congenital cardiac anomalies and holoprosencephaly start fairly early. Uh, and then at the very end, I'll tell you something about fatty liver. Then we work on ADHD. So in this room, I'm sure you all know that holoprosencephaly is the most common developmental defect of the forebrain and face in humans. The prevalence is as common as one in 250 embryos, really anything that common. By the time the children are born, it's one in 10,000, so that there is a, there's a rate of, of 
96%, over 96% of embryos are mostly spontaneously aborted, and they are mm. spontaneously aborted at six weeks, eight weeks, and mm. by the time they come here, then there's obviously the, the, the question over continuation of the pregnancy or termination, but most of them are not being terminated, but it's a spontaneous abortion. So at birth, about one in 10,000 children are alive, and the mortality rate continues if the child is born with severe holoprosencephaly, like a loba holoprosencephaly, most children die is in the first day of life, first two weeks of life, so that at one year of age, there's about one in 100,000. So that most people would consider rare. And then, strangely enough, we don't exactly understand it, that if children make it to one year of age, then make it to three years, five years, mm -hmm. 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years, so some mm -hmm. of them. So. And I'll show you some photos there. So you know what holoprosencephaly, what children look like with holoprosencephaly. So the, the, the fetal brain that you saw on the ultrasound and the imaging would be similar to this one here. So this would be the brain of a 16-weeker here, uh, where the, this is obviously a uh, uh, pathology specimen, where even at 16 weeks, you would expect there to be an interhemispheric fissure. The other part you would expect to be, you would expect to see salsa and geri, which you don't see here. And then this is the spinal cord, which is cut off here. So if I were to turn this brain around here, what you would see is, you would see it's just a one monoventricle. So this would be a loba holoprosencephaly. And then in the slide below, this would be semi loba holoprosencephaly. Here the brain is cut from front to back uh, in slices. And you see there's a separation at the posterior aspect of the forebrain. So that would be called a semi loba holoprosencephaly. The very first child that started the work on holoprosencephaly is this child here. I saw this child, this Dr. Elaine Zaktai, literally speaking 31 years ago, was the very first patient in, that I saw in my fellowship. So I was a little startled when I saw this child here. I was like, I had no idea how, how grateful I would be to this child because courtesy to this child here, um, that's why we worked on holoprosencephaly. So what you see here is you see there's synophthalmia. There is the iris, the irides are separated, but there's still one, one single eye hole here. The proboscis, the nose-like structure is above the eye. And embryologically, the way it works is obviously the optic nerves give rise to the eyes, the uh, olfactory nerves give uh, rise to the nose, and they're, so to speak, the olfactory nerves are above uh, the uh, optic nerves, and so if development is stopped at this point in time, that's why the proboscis is above the single eye here. Here's the proboscis between barely separated eyes. Here, there would be a child who has eyes that are separated, and uh, eyes that are separated, and there's just a single nostril there. So all of these children would die at birth and would not live more than just a half an hour or so. These are children who are born alive, and this would be the child where people would say the face predicts the brain when you have mid-facial hypoplasia. You actually come to think of it, this child has a bit of proptosis as well here. And here I'm telling you, oh, it's only in cranial synostosis, so you're all right. So, so and so. It's, it's really not clear. It seems like the minute you cut the cord of the baby start turning blue, and within a half an hour there is some <gasps> uh, short breathing, and then the, the baby uh, dies very shortly. So many babies who die, who, who live at first, there is frequently some crib death babies go to bed, mom want to wake baby up in the morning, and the baby is dead. So this happens at six months, happens at two years. It is something mild, just a cold, but push the baby over the edge. And so these are babies who are fragile. They're fragile on many levels. So these are children who have, would have a typical facial findings for holoprosencephaly. And then even though there's some mild dysmorphism here, these children would not be the ones that have typical holoprosencephaly. So what you see here is 
you see something that's quite typical in individuals who, are, who do not have holoprosencephaly, but who are carriers for a gene for holoprosencephaly. So this is what's called a single central incisor. Instead of having two front teeth, uh, individuals just have one front tooth. And then what is hard to see here, occasionally you have iris coloboma, as in this youngster here. On the right-hand side, there's a man who has a single central incisor, a patient of the famous Dr. Gorlin, and Dr. Gorlin, when he asked him, but didn't you think he was somewhat unusual having just a single central tooth? And he said, no, not really. My, my sister had the same thing. And of course, his sister had the same thing, and it turned out eventually his sister had two children with holoprosencephaly, and he had three children with holoprosencephaly mm -hmm. before we identified the underlying defect. And this man has holoprosencephaly due to sonic tetrach mutation. So, mm -hmm. so here there are typical faces of children who have holoprosencephaly, some you have seen already, the single eye. So if you hear psychopia, think holoprosencephaly. So truly, the face predicts the brain, and all children up to here would, would, be, would die at birth. So this is a single nostril here. And then here are children with bilateral cleft lip, with a white midline cleft lip, a midline cleft lip. And the causes of all of them are very different. From Smith's lamb, we open in this one, to a 6-3 mutation in this one, to uh, an 18p deletion in this one, 2p deletion in this one, and there's some, I forget, I think it's this child here, born to a mother who had uh, uh, untreated diabetes. So, mm -hmm. so the, the range, the etiology is extremely heterogeneous, and since I'm a pediatrician geneticist, oh, the one thing, sorry, Adrid, you correct your introduction, there was a pediatrics residency training came in between before oh. I came to the U.S. I'm a pediatrician. So. Okay. so, and here what you see here is, you Wait, see... Okay. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ben. So what you see here is you see, again, you see the single central incisor. And just so that you hear it, the single central incisor is not pathognomonic for holoprosencephaly. But if there's a child in one family who has holoprosencephaly, then the single central incisor tells you this parent is a carrier and not the other one. And so Dr. Gorlin would say for dentists, there are many conditions out there where people have a single central incisor. And the other part that I find quite striking, so these teeth here are the teeth of this woman here, and there's just some dental work where this is the central incisor and where these are the, the, the lateral incisors here. And it looks like as if these are two central incisors. So what's quite striking in individuals, not so frequently described, who are carriers, that there's this, what I call this pinched appearance of the nose. You may see this here. Right, and definitely the one in the top here. And there's some slight hypotelorism of closely spaced eyes, as I hear as well. And and the, brains the brains are completely normal, and, and all of the individuals who are on the photos here have a either average IQ or above average IQ. And then there's some families where there is some intellectual disability there. When you talk with mom, you think, okay, there is, I, I, I wouldn't want to do formal testing there, but in my humble opinion, there might be a decrease in, in IQ there, but in most it's not. And then one other thing is, it's hard to see that this child has mid-facial hypoplasia, but if he would press his nose in, there's no cartilage there, and the, the face would be totally flat. So, so there are many ways of, uh, many ways to have, uh, to, to signs as a carrier, and I will tell you about fatty liver at the very end, which is another sign as, as a carrier. This person has no cartilage in the nose here, yes, correct. But then in contrast, these here do, so it's different from person to person. And then sometimes, so you can tell I'm a German, Germans are not very funny, just think Angela Merkel, not very funny, <laughs> very smart, PhD in, in physics, but not exactly endowed with humor, so I have to take the jokes where they come. So, uh, so when you have a single center incisor, you're also missing the frenulum here. And sometimes I ask people in the audience, 
just put your tongue between your teeth, <laughs> or if there's a friend you look here, and if not, just come see me afterwards. <laughs> so these are the frequent complications. The, the, the one that they universally, if the brain findings are there, if you have brain findings of holoprosencephaly, there's always neurocognitive impairment. Then, of course, I can tell you of the one or two children that I've seen who could walk, I, I, I saw one child who said, I have holoprosencephaly. To me, it's like, boy, that is as advanced as it gets. But I remember the child because there was only one there in my entire 30 years of working with families who have a child with holoprosencephaly. So neurocognitive impairment is just about universally there. Many children, but not all, have seizure disorder. Then many have, again, not all, have electrolyte imbalances due to diabetes insipidus. That goes together with autonomic instability, high temperature, low temperature. And just a little cold can push a baby over the edge, and, and they are dead in the morning there. Many have cleft lip and palate, and then others have other major malformations, including cardiac defects. So this would be up to 5%. Some people say 10% there are anomalies there. Frequently, there's feeding intolerance. As you know, babies with clefting have a hard time sucking and, and drinking the breast milk. And, and babies with holoprosencephaly definitely have that. Then frequently, babies have recurrent aspiration pneumonia if they're not on a tubing feed, and then that will lead to their early death. So let me just tell you about the embryology that happens before you see the baby. So I'm happy to learn from you because sort of starting at eight weeks or so, what you know, I don't know. I know from when the baby is born, but I know a little bit what happens before. And I'm sure you have seen all of this quote before. Again, this is the German trying his, 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 uh, his, his time at, at Tumor here. So the most important time of your life is not birth, marriage, or death, but it's gastrulation, of course. <laughs> And gastrulation is the most important part because that is where the organs form. And gastrulation is really, you know, single cell, egg sperm come together, fertilized egg conception, then two cells, four cells, eight, 16, and so on. Then there is the morula. It looks like, it looks like a blackberry or a, a raspberry. And so then after that, this little ball of cells divides, divides up in a way that you have three layers looks like a hamburger, hamburger bun with a hamburger in between. So there's a mesoderm, an ectoderm, and an endoderm. That is what gastrulation. So this is what you see here. And the most important organ, really, we, we don't talk about this, but the most important organ that we all had is this one here, and that is the notochord. And this goes throughout the entire embryo, and it's the midline structure where at the head region there is something called Precordal plate, and that's the most special part of the notochord. So, in experiments from embryologists some 120 years ago, they would do this in chick embryos. They would take out the precordal plate, and when they would take out surgically the precordal plate and allow the embryo to continue to grow in the egg, then the, the, the chick embryo would develop holoprosencephaly and all facial, craniofacial anomalies. So, here you see a cut to this line here, and here's a precordal plate. And the precordal plate is very important. You will see this in the next slide. And so then this will develop into the rump here from the notochord. And just by the fact there's a precordal plate, this part knows that this is going to develop into the cranial aspect. And the cranial aspect you see here, this is the prosencephalon or the forebrain. And forebrain consists both of the Telencephalon is the diencephalon and mesencephalon, midbrain and hindbrain here. And holoprosencephaly is a disorder of both the diencephalon and uh, telencephalon. That's why it's called holoprosencephaly. So here you see the brain from the side a little further developed. And then here's the eye already. And the notochord would be along the anterior aspect of the developing embryo and not at the posterior aspect. So if you, if you get why gastrulation is so important, I think the other part that's so important is everyone thinks there are two eyes to start out with, but we start out with a single eye. Everyone starts out with a single eye, and the eye field would be this part here, the blue part here, 
And the reason the I divides is because there is a notochord here, and this would be the precordal plate. And the notochord, what it does is it expresses sonic hedgehog protein. And just by the fact it expresses sonic hedgehog protein, it leads to a separation of the eye. So the eye field or the division of the eye field is an active process. We all start out with a single eye, and then that separates into two eyes, and then that's what you have here. And that, uh, if you have the right amount of sonic hedgehog, that uh, puts the eyes just at the right spot, not too close, not too far. So if you have too much sonic hedgehog, the eyes would go a little further. If you have too little, the eyes stay a little closer, as you see in this slide here. Here's again, pre, uh, pre-cordal plate, eye field, and notochord. And when you, when you don't have enough sonic hedgehog, as you see here, you have eyes that are closely spaced. If you have no sonic hedgehog, then you have cyclopia. If you have no uh, precordal plate, then you have cyclopia again. So all of this is a spectrum. That's where all of us, our eyes are spaced apart a little bit different depending upon how much uh, sonic hedgehog we had and how much cholesterol was around. So that's really all I wanted to say about embryology. If there are any questions, please interrupt me at any time. So. So there are many genes there that cause holoprosencephaly. They were identified by our lab, and they were identified by other labs as well. There's a large group in France and a large group in a large group in uh, Brazil. And then the most recent big gene that was identified, FGFR1, was identified in Belgium. So I think the take-home message of this slide is not just are there many genes here, but that at least half. By now, if you use submicroscopic chromosomal alterations, at least two thirds are uh, cytogenetic anomalies or deletions and duplications. So the very first thought, a child that's born alive, would be half of it would be chromosome anomalies. So it would be very crucial to see this is a child with trisomy 13 because that would be the most common one. Okay. So the the part as a geneticist we always li like to do or liked to do, I speak in the past tense here, a genotype phenotype correlation. So this is all work by a colleague of mine who studied, who worked here at the Children's Hospital, Ben Solomon, and he did a very detailed genotype phenotype correlation looking at the most common genes, sonic hedgehog, 6-3, TGIF, and 6-2. And just to give you the bottom line of all of those studies, and looking at almost 400 people here, he finds no difference in phenotype between any of the genes. So if I were to see this child, I couldn't tell you which mutation does the child have. I would just have to do the testing here. And of course, not surprisingly, those with the most severe form will have the most severe form in the brain findings here. Here you see a lobar holoprosencephaly, but there's very little brain material left. In contrast, what he finds is Mutations within ZIG2, this is a, a, a gene, that's a gene that is what these children have. These children uh, have mild dysmorphism. This child is kind of hard to find any dysmorphism here, but clearly dysmorphism here. But a child with this little brain mass here can smile, maybe not responsively, uh, and would live for quite a long time. So children with ZIG2 anomalies, with normal or slightly dysmorphic findings of the face, they live much longer, despite the fact very severe brain anomalies. Um, if you've got a ZIG2 anomaly, mm -hmm. uh, uh, correct, that is correct. And the interesting part is, so all of these genes here, sonic hedgehog, the 6-3 is part of hedgehog signaling, and the others are part of hedgehog signaling. They're all expressed on the anterior aspect of the developing embryo, and ZIG2 is express, expressed on the posterior aspect. So that would explain why the facial findings are relatively, if not normal, but they are never. If you see a child with cyclopia, you can tell the one thing you can say is for sure it's not ZIG2. You can say that. So. They, they converge mostly into hedgehog signaling and there are a few other signaling pathways. And if a child or if the embryo 
doesn't have holoprosencephaly at gastrulation, you can't develop holoprosencephaly at 16 weeks. So if you were at normal brain development until 16 weeks, you can have all sorts of development, uh, all sorts of brain anomalies from hydrocephalus to vermis, cerebella anomalies, but the holoprosencephaly is not part of it. So many people talk about the different characteristics of inheritance of holoprosencephaly, and I wanted to tell you that what holoprosencephaly really is, it's with, almost without exception, and over 95% is autosomal dominant inheritance. And of course, you can tell there couldn't be this many affected individuals if this is a made-up pedigree. And of course, I couldn't do the automation animation. A summer student did this. I think either high, it was a high school student at the time, mm -hmm. and I could not do this. So, <laughs> but so autosomal dominant is very typical for holoprosencephaly. And then the other part is holoprosencephaly demonstrates really the two key concepts in genetics. And one is incomplete penetrance. So, for example, here is a woman who is a carrier for holoprosencephaly who has two daughters. Both of them are phenotypically normal, who has another daughter who has, is phenotypically normal, and she has a child with holoprosencephaly here. So that's incomplete penetrance. Penetrance means yes or no. Either I have anything at all or nothing at all, and then the other key concept in medical genetics is really the variable expressivity. And that would be, so for example, that this man would have a single central incisor or closely spaced eyes, which by themselves mean nothing, but it means that this is, would be a, a carrier here, and he has just the mildest form and doesn't have holoprosencephaly, but we just call it a carrier status here. In this, in this imaginary pedigree, these individuals in three different generations would have the severe form of holoprosencephaly. They would have died at birth, and then there are individuals who have the mild form who have just a microform, and that's the, the part of variable expressivity, and all of these individuals have a, the identical sonic cataract mutation. So this is a concept that is, if not universal, but for the birth defects that you see, at birth or that you see at 18 weeks, it's, it's very common that you have a parent or two parents who are phenotypically normal and say, how could this happen? It has never happened in our family before, but sometimes parents have two children with holoprosencephaly and they think it must be, or the, the, the healthcare professionals think it must be autosomal recessive and it means there's a carrier parent who doesn't know that he or she is a carrier parent. Okay, so environmental factors are a major part of holoprosencephaly. And there's a beautiful review out 10 years old, or sorry, eight years old or seven years old, and it's still as, as accurate as it was seven years ago. So untreated or poorly treated maternal diabetes mellitus, there's strong evidence in humans and even more so in animal models. In, for alcohol, there are too few reports in humans. And there's so much guilt involved with, with alcohol and so much blame and guilt and more psychology than you can imagine if you work with women who have a child with holoprosencephaly that the best studies are really in, in animal models. There are case reports in humans where women who had, who had heavy alcohol use during gastrulation that they had a child with holoprosencephaly, but that's not significant. Same thing in humans, it's probably, uh, same thing with uh, retinoic acid, which is mostly supported by animal models. There are some reports where, where uh, women had uh, this as acne medication, not just the creams, but the medication. They didn't know they were pregnant. And then there are the same thing. Again, there are case reports in humans of women who accidentally, or who accidentally became pregnant and were on statin use. And so there are case reports there. And then hypercholesterolemia in animal models, we know causes holoprosencephaly. So there was a this large scale in the in the nineteen sixties that sheep would have uh, lambs that had cyclopia and the shepherds knew if they would if the lambs if the, the ewes would graze in a different part of the mountain they wouldn't have holoprosencephaly. And so eventually it was found out there is a there's a flower there, a plant there that has a chemical in it that lowers cholesterol. So and the shepherds found that out if they eat this plant, then some 
of the offspring will have holoprosencephaly. We want live lamb. We don't want dead lamb. So, so they would go to other. They would raise somewhere. Else. So the the veterinarians found what that out. The plant. What say again? What was it? Uh, uh, Veratrum californicum. Beautiful plant, and mm. it it grows in the Midwest. I don't. I should bring a photo along. So. Okay. It doesn't grow here, so I didn't know it before. It doesn't grow in Germany, so. Good. Uh, I won't, so the question is perfect now. So my answer to maternal diabetes, I am not sure. So that doesn't exactly help. I have some sense of uh, why retinoic acid, alcohol, and hypocholesterolemia, why that ha has to do, what that has to do with holoprosencephaly. So uh, an overdose of vitamin A down regulates hedgehog signaling. So it's a little bit mm -hmm. like as if you have too little sonic hedgehog there, it down regulates it. Hypocholesterolemia, and then for that matter, cholesterol lowering drugs like statins. I didn't say this, I don't have a slide in here. Cholesterol is critical for sonic hedgehog to work properly. Sonic hedgehog is, a, is produced as a one molecule, has to, has to divide first a little bit like insulin in order to have an active form there. And it becomes active when cholesterol is bound covalently to one part of the sonic hedgehog form. Once that is also the connection to Smith's lambio, but there's not enough cholesterol around. So. so then what some people say is, so if I take statins, my, uh, my cholesterol, the goal is to get it down maybe just below 200, but not get it down to 80 or 70 or 60 or so. But there, the way that works is uh, statin is such a small L a molecule, it goes through the placenta barrier in no time and so what that does, it down-regulates cholesterol production in the embryo. And just by having little cholesterol in the embryo, that's why the embryo has a side effect. So, uh, maternal diabetes, I don't know. So, I don't know. so we have done a study. We have preliminary data. I will, I will tell you those preliminary data shortly. So this is, this is just what we did. We did something before pregnancy, after pregnancy. And just when you do a study like this, I want to be sure that, of course, you cannot use mothers who had a healthy baby as a normal control, because any mother who has a healthy baby with a, where the baby is doing fantastic, that mother will not remember everything that happened during the pregnancy, whereas a mother who has a baby with a birth defect will remember when she walked by or worked in an office that was newly painted, walked by a microwave lived in an area where we had lead exposure there. Mm -hmm. And all of this may well be true, but moms who have normal babies may have lived in, under the same conditions and they wouldn't remember anything. And so in order to, what, what is what people call a recall bias, you have to have a group of people where the control mm -hmm. group, also the moms have a baby with a birth defect. And we chose a birth defect called, called William syndrome because we have a collaborator who has many, uh, many uh, takes care of many uh, individuals with Williams syndrome. So these are data from a very early part. The study is much bigger now, but still with the controls, so the controls here would be by now up to 50, we're here up to 100. The p-values are not significant, but in essence what we can show, we can confirm that maternal diabetes is much more common in women who have a child with holoprosencephaly than in the control group. We find that alcohol use is twice as much, again, not statistically significant. And so this, in essence, is just confirming. What we were very interested in, and of course, you know that this group here is very interested in Zika. So we were very interested in so what do insecticides do because weed killers and insecticides in the animal model uh, uh, lead to microcephaly and in part lead to the findings both that would be similar to Zika and are similar to holoprosencephaly. So when we do this, believe it or not, we find in our first data here, we find a doubling of mm. women using weed killers. We find more personal insecticide use than in individuals and, and insect repellent 
than in individuals of the control group here. So these are again preliminary data, and we're very keen on on having finding more. And on the one hand, of course, we have about a thousand families with children where, where there's a child with holoprosencephaly. But the further you go back, if I would ask a mom who had a child with holoprosencephaly 30 years ago, she, clearly there would be little recollection of what happened during that pregnancy. So we go only back about two years or so in the hopes that there is not too much, uh, uh, too much wasn't forgotten yet. So these are just preliminary data here. Okay, so let me switch now to tell you what have we found with next generation sequencing. This is work of Paul Kuska in, in the group who is a staff clinician at the NIH. And when, when Paul looks at some 130 individuals with holoprosencephaly, where we have both parents and then compares them to the singletons here, I wanted to just point out, and of course with the geneticist, it's totally clear why you rather want to have mother, father, and child, because if then the child has a new mutation, you know maybe this is disease causing, whereas if a child who is a singleton, where we don't have mom and dad, uh, there it's, it's just not so easy. So, and and surpri not surprisingly, we've, we have with singletons, we have in half of the singletons, we have the moms, but we don't have the dads, so the dads are frequently no shows here, and so we we have this separated by by uh, type. So most of them have the severe type. semi loba holoprosencephaly would go under the severe type, and the ethnicity mostly is Caucasian, uh, and then Latin American here. So when when we when Paul looks at these, what he finds, he finds that about in the known genes that we know already, he finds pathogenic. Uh, genes in 28%. He finds some likely novel mutations here. And then he finds some, he finds in uh, individuals who, he finds mutations in genes that cause actually another disorder, mm -hmm. such as Baraitza Winter syndrome, Joubert syndrome. And on the next slide, I'll show you just a, for example, a fetus here. So this was an induced mm -hmm. abortion because this. This fetus, as you can tell, at 22 weeks has or 24 weeks has a cleft lip and palate, has a mid, mid facial hypoplasia. So this could be similar to the child that you saw, to the fetus that you saw in in the earlier uh, imaging here. So this is a, a G1 para 0, 24 year old woman. The fetus has cleft lip, semi loba holoprosencephaly. They thought could this be trisomy 13, normal karyotype normal microarray, when we did after this, we, we can't work with fetuses who are in ongoing pregnancy, but once this fetus was delivered, we could, we could look at mom, dad, and the child, and it turns out the child has a de novo stop mutation in a gene that causes Kabuki syndrome. And of course, in this child, no one, at least I couldn't tell this child has Kabuki syndrome, this child has holoprosencephaly, as far as I can tell. So this is in essence, good news for the parents because what it means is it's de novo and the recurrence risk would be only if the child is, if, if the, one of the parents has germline mosaicism. But other than that, this would be, I, I hate to say the word good news, but the, the recurrence risk would be low compared to a parent who is a carrier. And we have many more of those instances where we have fetal images where this just looks like holoprosencephaly, but at least fetal medicine, I could not tell, I'm a pediatrician, I couldn't tell, oops, I couldn't tell that this child had a specific syndrome to go with it. Okay. So the, the, the part of the work that we have done for quite some time now is we are working on holoprosencephaly and trying to work with the Kyoto collection. Something, I'm not touching it, so something isn't working is here. It, it could well be because it's flashy. And, and so what we do is we work with colleagues in Japan where what they have is the method of birth control in Japan in the 60s and 70s was to have an early abortion. So at six weeks, women would come and there was nothing to it. It was not objectionable. There were no ethics concerns there. And this was how the Kyoto collection was assembled of several hundred thousand embryos. And out of those several hundred thousand embryos, 
where the collection was based on just we don't want to continue the pregnancy for no other reason that uh, the, this collection exists, and there the number, the one in 250 embryos, comes from. Mm. So when we got the embryos from the Kyoto collection, we could see, as you can see here, you can see here the embryos that have holoprosencephaly at the various stages. There you find cyclopia, here you find cyclopia, and of course, we work with colleagues who are from Japan. This is Yu Abe, a pediatric neurologist from Japan who does the work in my lab. The depressing part is it was quite depressing working at the NIH for 10 years. It took me 10 years to get it to the IRB. At the NIH, there were a total of 11 protocols that work with embryo samples, and this has to go up the chain to the Department of Health and Human Services, it has to be approved by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And so this was approved, but the depressing part is. If you're in the CDC, didn't say anything about the NIH. I I didn't know this. I I didn't know this. So what what makes perfect sense is you cannot generate embryos to do the work. But this is these embryos have been around for 50 years, and they have been around in a fixative that in four years we have been unable to extract usable DNA. Oh. And I have worked with just about everyone and anyone. Everyone says, oh, my method works. Oh, please take my DNA here. And it doesn't work. So very depressing. After So you have to have a high frustration tolerance to do this project here. But we learned a lot. Never mind, we didn't find the underlying causes here. Bryn Weiss, who is now back in Israel, looked at adults with holoprosencephaly. And adults, some of them have a ZIG2 mutation. Others don't have any mutation in the known genes, but they have severe holoprosencephaly. Let me just end with telling you something about, so what does fatty liver have to do with it? There was a time when we did a, a site visit where we would do tours with our trainees. This was a tour in Philadelphia. You may know about the Siamese twins who lived in the 1800s and they had many, many, many offspring. There are some 5,000 offspring of the original Siamese twins. And my son loved this story. He always wanted to know, know from me, Dad, how do they do this? So these two men had two sisters as wives, and the, the, the sisters didn't get along with one another. They would spend one week in one sister's house and the other week in the other sister's house, and they lived in northern Virginia, very close by. And they one had 11 children, and the other one had 10 children. And of these offspring, there's still a club that meets annually. Of course, there is no genetics to twinning. There's just something went wrong in the twinning process. But the sad part, so they, they sell cookie cutters, and this is in the Mata Museum. You can watch the liver there. The, 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 fatty, the fatty liver of the Siamese twins, they, they had fatty liver, and that fatty liver, and I have to just give uh, Nicole Banks credit here, because Nicole Banks made the, made the, the cookie, cookie here from the cookie cutter here. And there's one of the, one of the Siamese twins was an alcoholic, the one on your left here, and you can see with a bottle in hand, he was a happy one. The sad part was the other one would get drunk when the first one would drink because the liver would, would not clear it, and so he would know, just quit it, he would tell his brother, but he would drink and then he would get drunk as well. And so the other twin survived his, his drunk twin by half an hour, but he knows this is my end as well. So what does it have to do with what does it have to do with holoprosencephaly? Ben Solomon, when he was in the lab, he looked at parents for microscience up and down, and we did we did ultrasound in the babies and the parents. We thought maybe there's some mid -life, mid left right asymmetry there, but there's none of it except for that in every parent there's one parent who has fatty liver, and of mm. course fatty liver is quite common among people who drink lots of alcohol, but in people non-alcoholic fatty liver, we don't understand the genetics well. And so what we find is that fatty liver in people who don't have risk factors, and the biggest risk factors are overweight, inactivity, and alcohol. If you don't have any of those risk factors, there has to be something genetic there. And so Sonic Ketchuk has something, has something to do with it. So those who like to drink would be doing well to have their Sonic Ketchuk tested first because what Sonic Hedgehog does, I didn't know this, in early embryogenesis, it's important for limb development and forebrain development. 
in postnatal life, it's crucial for liver cell regeneration. Mm -hmm. And so if you even have lowered, if you have half lowered uh, uh, sonic hedgehog signaling, your liver cells don't regenerate as fast. So some of the older children with holoprosencephaly, they have fatty liver as well. So fatty liver in a parent, even though there are many reasons for having fatty liver in, child, in children or in parents who have a child with holoprosencephaly, they, that would be another microform. So, okay. <laughs> Lastly, this work, I will spare you the summary, this work wouldn't be possible without people who do the work. Paul Kruska here, Eric Rössler here. Oops, this goes very fast. You Abe here, Eric Rössler. This year we have what, what I call half-jokingly our 25th anniversary. We have been working together for 25 years. He hates it when I say this, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And let me quote at the very end Muhammad Ali, who says, it isn't bragging when you can back it up with facts. So this is me <laughs> This is me doing a headstand at the beach here. So I just want to tell you, I can still do that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. And sorry I went over time here. So.